Our next guest is a critically acclaimed writer and MacArthur Fellow. His first two novels showed us a new dimension of the immigrant experience, introducing readers across the world to new landscapes, both emotional and geographic. His latest novel tells a poignant tale of love that transcends war, race, and even time. Mm -hmm. Here to discuss all our names is author Denal Mingestu. Welcome Thank to Arise. Pleasure to be here. Okay, we've just got to talk about how amazing you are. And, it's, <laughs> and I don't yeah. just think That's it, the apparently the whole day. world thinks yeah. it as well. You've written three successful and critically acclaimed novels, received a MacArthur Genius Grant, and you were selected as one of the New Yorker's 20 under 40 young writers and the National Book Foundation's five under 35. What do all the accolades mean to you? What do all the awards mean? You um, overachiever, you. I, well, I, think, I think they mean that, that, you, that you were lucky, that you were incredibly fortunate. Oh, no, know. we're not no, gonna let is. you say it that. Is. There's, there's no. a lot of really great stories being told out there, a lot of really great novelists. Um, and I think part of why I've been so fortunate is I've filled empty spaces that, often, that haven't been occupied yet before by other writers. When you say empty spaces, what do you mean exactly? I mean, narratives that, that bridge these, these different continents, these countries, oh. stories that are, that are as concerned with Africa as they are with the United States, stories that touch on race, class, um, economics, and, and violence and war, of course, at the same time, but not just from the perspective of, of a purely African perspective or a purely American perspective, but stories that try to figure out how these two different narratives can be wound together. So well, you I'm attribute your success to luck? I think <laughs> many things are I attribute to luck. Uh -huh. um, you know, I think I've, I've worked very hard and I've listened very closely, I think, to the stories that I've grown up with and to the experiences of people around me. So I wouldn't say it's luck so much as um, I've, been in, I've been a fortunate inheritor of, well, of many things. I want to let our viewers know that you're being modest, so I'm going to read what the New York Times said yes. about in, inside of your rave review. Mm -hmm. The New York Times says that Mingestu has grounded his search in a story so straightforward, yes. but at the same time so mysterious that you can't turn the pages fast enough. And when you're done, your first impulse is to go back to the beginning and start over. <laughs> what does it feel like to be so well received by yeah. such an institution? Well, I, I automatically think of all the readers who are going to see that review and realize that they didn't feel the same way. So we, yeah, you realize that it's... <laughs> no. Glass well, half full uh, yeah, or half exactly. empty, yeah. my friend. I think that's supposed to be part of the, part of the role of the novelist yeah. is to be slightly cynical. That's um, true. And it's also a good way of, of detaching yourself from the praise because it's really the work that matters the most and it's the work that, um, that you're concerned with and that work is created over such a long, solitary space that you know when it does finally come out in the public, the receptions, they're wonderful, of course, they're great, but, um, but you, know, you know that you have to go back to work again at the end of the day, that you have to go back to your little office, your quiet corner, and the stories that you write about, sometimes you worry that no one's ever gonna pay attention to them. You, know, you feel like you write about characters and lives that oftentimes are seen as being on the margins. Sure. And so when you have that reception, it helps mitigate that anxiety, but at the same time, that anxiety remains. Well, you say characters and lives. How uh, much of your life is informed by this story? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm always stealing from my life. Um, yeah. You know, my first novel definitely took really strong echoes from narratives of my family. Yeah. Um, I narrated, I named the characters in my first novel from members of my family who had died in the revolution in Ethiopia. Um, a lot of this happened in this novel, are, especially the most place in Africa, are, are touched by my experiences as a journalist. Well, for example, like Isaac, your family was driven from your homeland yeah. by revolution. Exactly. So can you talk a little about that? Yeah. So I mean, Well, I actually, before you get there, let's just talk about what the novel is about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's circle let's back try. and yeah. bring uh, the viewers back. up to yes. speed. Right, okay. Yes. Um, it, it centers it, around Isaac. Exactly. It's, it's set in the 1970s initially. He's an Ethiopian who ends up in Uganda. Okay, tell us more. Correct. So there's, um, there's two narratives. The first part is exactly that narrative mm -hmm. of two young men who meet on a college campus uh, in Kampala in the early 1970s. And they meet out of this sort of youthful ambition to want to make something better, um, not only for themselves, but for the, for the country that they're in and for the continent as a whole. And they have these great literary and, and political ambitions. And, and those ambitions are, are thwarted or undermined by the sort of politics at that time. And the second half of the novel takes place in the US in a small college town in the Midwest. And it centers around an interracial relationship yes. primarily between Helen, who's a social worker, a white social worker, yes. and Isaac. Exactly. Talk to us about why it was important for you to explore that dynamic as well um, because I one of the stories one of the I think the through lines of the novel is to try to get at the, the periods after the revolutions and the liberation movements that happened not only in Africa but in the United States so we have this great moment of 
of freedom that happened in the post-colonial era across the continent. All these countries were becoming independent, and yet at the same time there was um, a lot of problems that, that followed. You know, there was a sense in which the liberation movements were still deeply um, frustrated by the colonial legacy. And the same thing happens here in the United States. We have the civil rights movement, which grants so much fought, well, so much well-fought um, rights to African Americans, and yet at the same time, the persistent problems of racism and economic disparity continue to haunt the country. And so having this interracial relationship was one way of trying to make that argument, to say that, you know what, perhaps we've had some legislative gains, perhaps we've made some progress, some movement, but when you move into the quieter space of what happens when two people sit together at a restaurant or at a coffee shop, how comfortable are we with that? And you bring up one of the most important and poignant scenes in the book. This interracial couple goes out to lunch. The black man is served yeah. on paper plates and, and plastic utensils. Yes. His partner, a white woman, is served on proper dishes. And it's the subtle racism, yeah. in it, isn't it, that can exactly. be most painful There's sometimes. There's a great line in there that yeah. what you're talking about. It's uh, now you know. This is how they break you slowly, exactly. slowly. in pieces. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because oftentimes we, you know, we, we tend to think, well, because those overt forms of racism aren't tolerated anymore, that they no longer exist because we don't use the words that we are so commonly associated with them, that somehow everything has been um, healed yeah, or solved. We're post-black, exactly. we've moved on, exactly. But in fact, we're not. Um, we continue to experience those slights, those forms of minor injustice, or, or great injustice, but not with the same vocabulary. And oftentimes it's those small gestures, the, the look that someone gives you, the, the paper plates. Um, yeah. that Is it improvements the, the, the at a petty pace, or does it still kind of exist? Does it still kind of lie beneath? I think, well, I think it will always exist. I think yeah. what our, our obligation is to not shy away from it. You know, yes. I think it's, whether it exists or it will, will never be perfect, right? We'll right. always have those, those festering wounds in our society yes. and in our culture. The question is how honestly can we actually look at them? How thoughtful can we take those problems on and not shy away and try to say that, well, we're now in this post-racial world. We have an African-American president. Clearly all the problems have been solved. But say, well, great, we've made these enormous gains, um, but let's see what else we can do now. Let's talk about the character characters' names, yeah. Isaac. He's born with 13 names, yeah. is that correct? And he decides that he wants to strip himself of all those names because he feels like they're shackles. Yeah. And not having the names gives him freedom. First of all, how many names were you born with? <laughs> <laughs> well, my name's very strange because my father named me while well, he was writing the U.S. So he left Ethiopia just before I was born. And he had a very dramatic idea that he wanted to give a new name to his son that had never existed before. So no one actually has my name. Oh, now so. it's um, entirely special and particular to me. So definitely this idea of names is, is very, very personal and very intimate to me. Um, and the idea that by recasting yourself as something else, you can unshackle your yourself in this history, this, um, which is both a great thing and a problem, and a problematic thing. Humpa Lahiri talks about the importance yeah, of names of in the Indian the namesake, culture yeah. as well, the namesake, obviously, so yeah. it's interesting to see the idea yeah. of how important names are in yeah. certain cultures. And definitely, when I, when I finally went back to Ethiopia um, after 25 years, you know, I went to the village where my father had been raised in, and there is a tradition there where we change our last names every generation, so young men do have, so my father could name, um, I think, back to seven or eight generations at least, so every single... Uh, relative that's preceded him, so we keep track of our genealogy that way. Really? Yeah. Okay. When did you know that writing would be your life's calling? Pretty early on. Um, you know, I'd say by the time I was in high school and college, I, I realized that, um, you know, I felt profoundly frustrated by, by being, um, uh, by growing up black in America. You yeah. know, they created all these anxieties and problems, and also having this history in Africa that um, I didn't quite know how to locate or, or relate to other people on that. No one knew what my name was, where it came from. Um, and so writing became a way of creating that space for me. You know, I began to, to take stories from my family um, and invent new narratives out of those stories. You were say, born in Ethiopia. You right. were, uh, came here at two yes. to America. Yeah. Do you consider yourself Ethiopian or American? Well, yeah. that's always the problem, right? Um, Talk so, about uh, it. Well, yeah. that's why for a long time I didn't, for a long time I chose not to say that I was American. Um, I think I was so frustrated by those experiences of racism that I figured why, why attach myself to a place that um, has time so, so vociferously denied my existence when I can also just look back to Ethiopia. But I also realized I am very much a product of America as well, and so um, I tend to believe and argue that I, I can be both, that yeah. I can claim full authority over my Ethiopian identity and heritage, and also say, of course, I'm American. I, I live here. Piggybacking on Patrick's question really quickly, do you consider yourself a writer or an African writer? <laughs> um, I consider myself a writer, and I think as writers, our concerns are, are 
profoundly human at their core. And so to, to attach a particular ethnicity or country, and, and Africa is such a complex place. I feel like when we begin to attach the sort of specificity of a continent, we lose the diversity that we constantly argue for when we say Africa can't be summarized or, or thought of as one singular entity. It's 54 countries, thousands of languages, so much diversity. I would hate to try to say that I'm somehow emblematic of all of those things at once. Very good point. Oh, we want you to stay, but we've got to go. <laughs> your book has ushered in my summer reading. So <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much for being here. And you're watching Arise Entertainment 360.